Okay, good, now, yes. yeah, good afternoon and, and welcome to this session on, on hydrogen in the in the CBAM. Um, we'll get it, give it a few minutes. My name is Andre Marco, I'm the, the director of ERCST, but we'll give it a few minutes because we have a few participants that are joining online. There are a number of heroes here in the room. They will all get a cookie at the end of the session for being present in person. But uh, we'll give it a few moments just for people to uh, uh, to join. Uh, I see my my two colleagues, Michael Milling and and Aaron Cosby. Uh, it's what time is Aaron? Is probably some six in the morning or something like that, right? Seven in the morning. I'm losing track of what the time it is because he's in British Columbia. And Michael is in New York, so th that is going to make it only six hours. So that's almost normal time. But let's wait for a moment while uh, while people sign on, sign in, and then we we can can get started. Uh, I'll I'll talk to the uh, through the agenda. Uh, first of all, this is not a Chatham House rules meeting. If I'm uh, Antonio, correct? correct? This is not a Chatham House rules meeting. Normally, our meetings are the Chatham House. In this case, it is not. Um, and uh, the way we uh, we will proceed on this is was a presentation by the um, ERCST team that deals with, with, with CBAM and hydrogen. This is one of the joint ventures between the hydrogen and the CBAM people. Uh, I'm not going to make any presentation. It is going to be Aaron Cosby and Mike Melling and, and Olivier and Antonio. Uh, <clears throat> and then we're very pleased that Vicente Hurtado Roa from Digitat Sud that had been stick handling CBAM for the last couple of years, and you know it's a Canadian expression <laughs> uh, that that uh, it is joining us, uh, and then we will have a discussion uh, on uh, with stakeholder uh, reactions, and we have a number of uh, of participants in here for different uh, areas. I will introduce them at that time. Uh, and we hope for a very, uh, a very, very sustained and, and uh, a vigorous discussion, uh, as always when it is the case for ERCSD. Now, I'm not going to make a presentation, but what I'm going to say is the fact that uh, ERCSD has been involved in CBAM from very early on, and it is to a large degree uh, thanks to uh, also my, my colleagues, Mike Melling and, and Aaron Cosby that we have put together a team that is quite balanced and, and, and produces has produced relatively good quality stuff or so people tell us. But at the same time, we have also been involved quite in a, in a, in a strong way in the discussion of hydrogen policy. And that discussion on, on that side has been led by, by Olivier Imbo and, and, uh, and Antonio Fernandez. So this has been an opportunity for the, if you're on the two teams to speak together and work together and then to test our uh, horizontal collaboration. Uh, we have last year, one of the outputs that the work that ERCST has done on CDAM has put forward a, a, a deep dive sectoral analysis, looking at the various, at that time, we're looking at the, the sectors, the, uh, the, the various sectors that were proposed to be covered by CBAM and looking at the various options that were proposed for CBAM and how they would uh, impact, uh, how they would be impacted in terms of choices that would made by the characteristics of the sectors. So it's very much looking at characteristics sectors and say, well, for this sector, it would be better if you had this option for scope and this section for this and section for that. Now we are at a different, um, uh, we are a different stage. And at this stage, we were a little bit surprised. I, you know, Vicente was one of the surprises that I think some people expected, some people expected less hydrogen to be included. I, you know, rumors were swirling, but <laughs> nevertheless, you don't believe it until you see it. Uh, and hydrogen was, was included. So what we agreed to do and we thought it was important is to understand the relationship with the CBAM and, and hydrogen. But in this case, a bit of a different analysis. So it's not the analysis is this is a characteristic of CBAM and what choices do we make? Because the choices have been made. It's not completely made because there are still things that need to be made. But nevertheless, 
we can't have that discussion. So the discussion is very much in the current, if the current architecture and choices that were made for CBAM, what is the impact on, on, uh, on hydrogen and the development of a hydrogen economy and the development of hydrogen market? So it's a little bit, you know, putting the, the, uh, the horse and the cart in different water when you do this, uh, but uh, it's also a very important, so it is with very important element. So this is very much part of the discussion, the sectoral deep dive is just at a different stage of the discussion. Now, having seen that we have a number of people that have joined, I think, Antonio, I think we're safe in safe hands to say that we can we can start. Yeah. So I will start now by, I think, Antonio, you will put the, you will put the slides up. Yeah. And we'll let you guys go in the order that we have discussed today. Again, I repeat, this is not under Chatham House rules. Go ahead, please, and, and, and let's get started. Yeah, I can move directly to the structure of the presentation that will mirror uh, the, the, the structure of the report. And I will let Olivier to, to present uh, his part. Thank you. I mean, I will just to say, make some introduction about this uh, structure. It was a surprise. I mean, we were working on the hydrogen stream uh, with Antonio without any interaction. Then, pop, surprise, uh, <laughs> push the, the say, this uh, hydrogen in the CBAM. Whoa. So we had to, let's say, uh, understand what was CBAM and what was the consequences on the hydrogen uh, market. The question is that uh, we were not uh, really understanding the future of the hydrogen market, and we had a lot of, let's say, work to do. Uh, and now we have to explain something that we do not master totally. So uh, the advantage of this proposal was to uh, force us uh, to ask the good question. That was let's say, the, the positive, uh, let's say, uh, move. And we had a lot of discussion with uh, Michael, with Aaron, who are experts in the CBAM, but uh, we still have, let's say, a lot of uh, issues, I mean, to uh, understand the uh, agent inclusion in the CBAM. Why? First of all, we are humble. I mean, uh, we lack of a real knowledge of the current and future agent market. And, that is quite surprising because, I mean, uh, for me, it's surprising because I've been working in the hydrogen market for more than 30 years. So, uh, but when we are discussing the, uh, let's say, the future of the hydrogen market with all the sector, the number that we heard are slightly different from our ambition. So we try, I mean, to, let's say, uh, obviously understand what are the difficulty of the agent market. And it is the reason why the first thing that we have as in this, uh, let's say, uh, report is the market consideration, because we need to understand what would be, what is the market and what would be the market in the future. And for example, I mean, uh, we had, I mean, I had a totally different view of export slash import of hydrogen uh, that the commission has, because I mean, we had, let's say, the number from the commission. My, let's say, practical, practical thing was 500 tons per year, because I was in charge, I mean, to, let's say, distribute those semi trailers. So, why? Gosh, I mean, uh, there is an issue on that. So, we need to work on that. We need to understand what is, let's say, these. Current import and export, but it is only one aspect of, or let's say, uh, non real knowledge of the current market and how it will be developed. The second point, and we had a lot of discussion, uh, Andre was asking me, but what do you, let's say, want to say in this part because of the regulatory complexity? I mean, it, it is quite incredible. Incredible when you look at the puzzle of all those regulations regarding hydrogen and then CBAM arrived. So it decreased the uh, regular action. So the high effect 
collateral effect that, that we need to understand. And one example is the uh, indirect emission. So uh, we will have, let's say, some uh, discussion of that. And it is the reason why we have, let's say, obviously try to capture what are the environmental consideration and the regal regulatory aspect. Um, and then you will see that uh, we have identified some four key points, maybe not the only one, but at least, I mean, those are the key points that we want to discuss. Uh, and the, the third point at the end is the, there is something which was not forecast, the brutal change in the world with the war, the Ukraine war, and the implementation of the Inflation Reduction Act. So all those, all those consequences were not expected. And the, uh, let's say, priority that we had regarding the development of hydrogen are a little bit reshuffled because uh, now we see that the fossil hydrogen is more expensive than the uh, renewable one. Wait, is it, a, should be good, it should be good news. And when we, let's say, ask, it is a good news to all the sector, no. It's not the good news. Why is not the good news? Because at the same time, uh, our industry using hydrogen are closing in Europe. BASF is closing a part of that. So uh, there is a, a lot of ambition, but there are some reactions which are not aligned with the ambition. And the fact is, these, let's say, uh, interactions are based on simple facts. When you want to invest, you look at the cost. Natural gas is cheaper in the US. Uh, electricity, co electricity costs are more predictable in some part of the world. And investment in renewable hydrogen are more profitable in some part of the world when you have the inflation, let's say, uh, reduction act. So those aspects are impacting the last one, the trade patterns. So we have a lot of questions, at least, I mean, the hydrogen in the sea band has, let's say, obliged us to go deeper in these analysis. And we are, let's say, very keen to discuss that with you, with Vicente, because, I mean, he had the possibility to give us more consistency in these, let's say, uh, the inclusion of hydrogen in CBAM, we will have a lot of questions. And I will give the floor now to Antonio to discover what we have seen in those, let's say, different part of these, uh, let's say, point. So Antonio, can you please take it from here? Sure, sure. Thanks a lot, Olivier. And uh, yeah, so what Olivier described were a little bit the hydrogen related considerations that are needed to understand then the assessment we have carried out, identifying some of the implications of the inclusion of hydrogen in CBAM. So these is two parts, but uh, maybe a brief reminder of why are we here? Uh, probably this is known but, uh, by most of you, but <laughs> hydrogen of course was included in the scope of CBAM, was not, not part of the initial proposal of the commission, it catches some, some of, of us maybe a little bit by surprise. And then we move to the scope of emissions. And uh, as it was mentioned already, the CBAM should apply uh, to indirect uh, emissions or indirect emissions should not be calculated initially for the goods that receive indirect cost compensation and hydrogen has been included in the list of sectors that will receive indirect cost compensation. So, um, that's a bit tricky, let's put it like this. Uh, there, there is a review clause, I think Article 30, that says that before the end of the transition period, the European Commission will assess the possibility of extending the CBAM scope to embedded indirect emissions for sectors in Annex 1A. So it's not set in stone, it may change. 
Uh, in relation to the trade flow, the, the, the issue of exports, and it's, as Olivier mentioned, uh, today uh, imports and exports of, of hydrogen are very, very low. So maybe that's not the most important part of, of today's discussion. But the European Commission will assess every two years from the end of the transition period, again, 2026, uh, as part of, of its annual report, the situation as regards of exports. Then the issue of free allocation. This, uh, I think we will know this. So free uh, uh, CBAM will uh, replace the current regime of free allocation. So uh, it will free allocation will be phased out during a nine-year period, and this will happen pro progressively. And there is a bunch of delegated acts and implemented acts that will come over. 12 or 14, we have identified in the paper that will probably affect some parts of the hydrogen. We have tried to summarize this in the paper. So, um, so there are many things that are still open. So, yes, just sorry. a second. Yeah. I mean, the one thing that you're going to have to look at is, or the way I look at this, is if I if I were a producer of hydrogen, which I'm not, or in general industry, my question would be: Do I want to be in the CBAM, or do I want to, you know, or do I want to be outside the CBAM and have the indirect cost? Which one, which one do I want? What is the uncertainty? What is the bigger uncertainty for me? And I think that's part of a big part of the discussion. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So now what we will present quickly is a picture of where we are now and where we are supposed to, to move. Um, so today, um, there are, so today, I mean, with data from 2020, uh, in the EU, we have a demand of 8 million tons of, of hydrogen per year, 50% uh, more or less used in refineries and about 40% using ammonia production. And uh, over 90% of these um, is currently produced by, by fossil fuels uh, with a process known as, as methane reforming. And 90% of the total hydrogen production capacity is, uh, is self-produced, so on-site or, or, or recovered, and just 10% is what we refer to as merchant hydrogen, hydrogen that is outsourced, outsourced uh, let's say. And this is where the, the European Commission wants to go. Um, um, this is an ambition, so it's not, the, the, the target is not binding, but the European, uh, so the Repower EU aims to have 10 million tons of renewable hydrogen uh, produced in the, in the EU, plus 6 million tons of uh, imported renewable hydrogen, so in total 16, plus four, uh, million tons in the form of ammonia and other derivatives like uh, in methanol, in kerosene, or ETS, right? Um, how are we going to transition to this? So according to the European Commission, we all know that several incentives have been introduced, mainly probably the main one are the mandates, binding mandates that we will have in the, in the red for the industry and the transport sector, but there are plenty of others, like you know, we have the hydrogen bank, the um, the UETA, I mean the free allowance is being extended to to also electrolyzers and so on, but this is just an ambition. And uh, what we want to to say here is that this view contracts with other more conservative uh, demand driven uh, forecasts because we don't know what the demand will be. That's one that's ambition, but it's very difficult to predict where the demand will be in 2030. So if there, therefore, it's is, uh, really difficult to uh, assess what will be the reliance on imports by 2030, and therefore, to what extent uh, hydrogen uh, is needed, because we don't know the exact amounts of, of imports that we will have. Um, then, but very briefly, the market consideration, then we move to the environmental considerations. So the average THG emissions of all hydrogen installations covered, covered by the ETS, taking into account data from the years 2016 uh, and 17, was 10.72 tons of CO2 equivalent uh, per ton of hydrogen produced, quite high. And the average THG emission intensity of the 10 most uh, efficient installations for, the, for this year, where the data come from, was for 0.09 tons of uh, CO2 equivalent per ton of hydrogen, meaning that these will get 100% of, uh, of, of the allocations for free. And it's important to, to take, I mean, to understand that, that the main source of emission for hydrogen production under the UETS, uh, the, the UETS directive are direct emissions. 
and the scope of the ETS directive only includes process based on, on fossil fuels. That's, that's relevant. Um, in terms of free allocation under the current EUTS directive, then only fossil fuel based hydrogen is entitled to free allowances. So, can I ask you a quick question? Yeah. So, you're saying that the, the 4.09 is uh, consisting entirely of purely fossil based hydrogen production processes? Yeah. Yeah. If, if I am not mistaken, also it takes into account the, the one that uh, is produced with fossil fuels plus this year. Yeah, because I mean, when you are producing hydrogen, you are producing also heat, you are also producing CO, monoxide car of carbon. So in this case, all the repartition, which was defined by the ETS benchmark, give you uh, a number which is allocated on the pure hydrogen production. And they say a lot of uh, installation has uh, have optimized all the byproduct of the uh, uh, let's say SMR, trying to minimize the cost and to maximize I mean the uh, mechanism of the emission. So you reach this four point zero. I do that's for the part. Top ten percent. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 and it yeah. was not included in the ETS phase. Or because I mean we had let's say a single benchmark with the refinery, and the refinery set the let's say mm -hmm. uh, benchmark which was a little bit more than six, but mm -hmm. it was mentioned that if we were not linked to sure. the hydrogen benchmark, we had to let's say follow this uh, number. Yeah. Okay. So this is now and in the future, so hydrogen produ produced through the electrolysis of water is expected to, to play a key role. So linking it with the free allocation discussion. So as a result of the ongoing EUETS uh, directive reform, then the scope of the directive and subsequently the scope of free allowances be, will be expanded to cover all hydrogen uh, production modes. So de facto, including uh, electrolytic hydrogen, or like it electrolytic hydrogen, entitled to free allowance. That's which, which, which I'm still personally puzzled by, but that's okay. Okay. And then um, we move to the, to the trade patterns and other considerations where we looked at what types of hydrogen will be imported or are expected to be imported how this hydrogen will be delivered into the EU and what are the impact factors that will uh, condition both. So, and all of this is based on, on pure assumptions because it's very difficult to predict. But we start from the fact that today import and export of hydrogen are very, very low. We have all the incentives in the EU regulatory framework, mainly, as we said, it, uh, the, the binding targets of the red. So it seems reasonable to expect that the imports will pursue an alignment of, of this uh, regulatory framework. And in this sense, we expect that renewable hydrogen imports probably will prevail over other types of, of production. But it is still true that the red is under uh, negotiation now, and that there are some member states that are pushing to include uh, low carbon hydrogen to count towards the red target. So, if this would be the case, maybe we would have as well an increased number of low carbon hydrogen imports. So how will uh, renewable hydrogen be delivered? So I think science uh, says that for short distances, compressed hydrogen pipelines where hydrogen is transported as a gas, um, offer lower cost that chemi than chemical carriers do. And chemical carriers such as liquid organic uh, hydrogen carriers or ammonia become more competitive the longer the distance. Um, also, hydrogen imports are expected in the form of, of, of derivatives and carrier, and we will think about this in the in the second part. And it is also possible that they will be embedded in the in the in the final products like steel in the future or per, per, fertilizers. But there are a range of factors that will influence that. I mean, the main one probably energy prices because if you have a very high prices for hydrogen in the EU, you probably will rely more on imports of hydrogen or the other way around. You may end up reallocating your industry where hydrogen is cheaper and then export the, the final product. 
all, all these considerations are relevant for uh, assessing the, the, the implications of CBAM coverage. And now we, we move to this part, to the part of CBAM consideration, and I will give the floor to, to my colleague, Michael, to... Mike, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Thank you, Antonio Olivier. Um, Andre, you know, uh, Aaron reminds me when, when things are fun, time flies. You said that our sectoral deep dive was last year. It's actually been two years. So that tells us that this activity has been very enjoyable. And one thing that I think, you know, we can say looking back at, looking at sort of the more traditional sectors, the usual suspects for the CBAM at the time, obviously the metals and, and cement and so on. We also looked at chemicals. Those were complex sectors, but I think hydrogen tops that. It's really, I mean, it adds tremendous additional complexity in terms of the rapidly evolving marketplace, um, the demand supply, et cetera, situation, and the regulatory framework. So this is really a tricky one. And Aaron and I come at this together with Andre from, from the CBAM. So we're not hydrogen experts. We're looking at it through the lens of having worked on CBAM for several years, as Andre mentioned. One aspect that seems to us relevant, of course, and that's quite intuitive or obvious, if you like, is that the CBAM is seen as the, the key to phasing out, to accelerating the phase out of free allocation. Antonio already alluded to that. And um, without that, the benchmarks, of course, um, that govern free allocation are becoming more stringent as the top performers become more and more carbon efficient, if you like. But that has been capped in the ETS directive, in the revised ETS directive. So that was sort of predictable and limited. But now we have the CBAM replacing free allocation. And so, of course, that will change um, the, the, the situation for hydrogen producers by accelerating the phase out of free allowances. And um, it's probably too early to understand really how this relative comparison of tightening benchmarks and continued free allocation would have performed what what the sort of how this would affect have affected the competitiveness of European hydrogen producers compared to now having the CBAM include hydrogen and thus accelerate this phase out of free allocation. There's so many factors at play, but at least it is possible that this will increase costs. It's likely that this will increase costs for domestic hydrogen producers on average, you know, across the board, and that this could then um, favor competing foreign production and thus imports of hydrogen instead. So again, too early to sort of predict exactly what the, what the dynamics will be, but as with the other sectors, the loss of free allocation replacement of CBAM does raise some questions and some uncertainties. Let's move to the next slide. But this is, Michael, this is just going back for a second. This is a typical discussion, whether you want free allocation or you want CBAM. Yeah. It comes back to the same story. Go ahead. Exactly. And free allocation plus um, compensation of indirect emissions for those member states that provide it. The second thing is that while we're not so familiar with these other regimes, we, we are aware, as, as um, and Antonio described it, that there are uh, multiple other regimes, if you like, in which hydrogen is playing a role and in which definitions of what consists renewable hydrogen or you know, sustainable hydrogen, et cetera, are being coined. Um, and in which methodologies under those definitions are being elaborated. That's, of course, the delegated act under the Renewable Energy Directive, under the revised Renewable Energy Directive. Um, there is a discussion on, on the hydrogen and gas package or directive, where likewise there is discussion of what constitutes low carbon hydrogen. The taxonomy on sustainable finance for sustainable or green finance is <laughs> equally has a definition of what constitutes sustainable hydrogen. And then there's private standards as well. And of course, the CBAM is going to have a um, implementing act that sets out how to apply the um, methodologies for measurement reporting or monitoring reporting and verification of embedded, of specific embedded emissions of hydrogen um, as specified in Annex 3 of the regulation. So there's a multitude of different regulatory frameworks with definitions and methodologies on how to determine, if you like, the sustainability or carbon intensity of hydrogen. And while I have no doubt that the various services in the commission that are in charge of elaborating these are communicating with each other, there's still concern, of course, that there might be inconsistencies or even conflicts between some of these regimes. So that too is yet to be seen because many of these are still under elaboration 
Um, but it does likewise create a certain amount of uncertainty and concern about potential administrative burdens and transaction costs of having to apply numerous different uh, methodologies and regulatory frameworks to hydrogen. Let's go to the third slide that I'll cover before I hand over to Aaron. And that is uh, an old and familiar and tricky topic uh, also with the other products covered by the CBAM, namely circumvention. In the case of hydrogen, it's particularly relevant the, in, in, um, with regard to the way that hydrogen is transported over longer distances. So really sort of outright pipeline transport of hydrogen so far is occurring usually over smaller distances, longer distance transport, often in the, in the form of carriers like liquid organic hydrogen carriers and uh, in form of derivatives. So already in the next sort of product on the value chain. And um, except for ammonia, which is covered as part of the fertilizer product group, um, really only hydrogen is covered and liquid organic hydrogen carriers or derivatives like methanol or synthetic gases and fuels like e-fuels, e-kerosene, diesel, methane are not included in the scope of the CBAM. So coming from a CBAM sort of perspective, it raises the flag, well, can this lead to circumvention? Obviously, foreign producers that are looking to sell on the European market, they may then have an incentive to switch in, instead of you know, producing hydrogen and shipping compressed hydrogen or liquefied hydrogen to instead focus on liquid organic hydrogen carriers to avoid the CBAM or indeed to then produce the downstream sort of the derivatives and sell those instead. Um, likewise, you could have European producers shift to uh, abroad, produce the derivatives and then import, re-import those. So you could have leakage on that. And it need not only affect these fuels um, and hydrogen derivatives mentioned here, it could also extend to other products like, say, for instance, steel produced with hydrogen. Would this sort of create, a, even if only marginal incentive for producers, they're looking to produce steel with direct reduced iron and hydrogen in Europe and facing the additional cost of hydrogen now being covered by CBAM, since they'd say, well, maybe it's better to produce that clean steel abroad and re-import it into the EU. Again, it's very early to say whether or not you know, these will be really relevant and material, but at least there is that sort of potential. And of course, for producers that are currently already producing both hydrogen and derivatives or using carriers would have a potential incentive to shuffle what they then sell to the EU and what they consume domestically or sell into third markets. Um, similar challenges that we face with other goods under the CBAM um, in terms of potential circumvention. It is not easy to deal with that. Article 27 of the regulation does set out um, a mandate to sort of monitor trade flows and report on if there have been any sort of significant changes or suspicious patterns to potentially come up with a response in policy in a revision of the future CBAM regulation. But again, experience shows this is tricky, for instance, in California with uh, resource shuffling under the ETS and electricity imports. And with this, I'll hand over to Aaron yeah. for the final slide. No? Before that, Mike, I did, the only thing that I would, I would note here is the fact that this product, is, it, chemicals are a lot more complex in terms of the products. The regulatory, the regulatory framework and the choices of colors and many other things makes, as in my opinion, makes hydrogen complicated when it not ought to be anywhere as complicated as, as, as it has become, at least in, in, in my own opinion. And this leads, to, if you look at circumvention and resource shuffling, resource shuffling typically is you selling your low carbon product, the same low carbon product from one country to the other. You know, you, know, you, you produce it, you're selling, keep in China your, your high carbon uh, aluminum and you export the low carbon one. In, in here it's different. You are, uh, the interpretation is that you, you keep some products that, that are based on hydrogen and and some of them are direct to, uh, to Europe and some of them direct somewhere else. So the, I think the, the regulatory complexity is what really makes life complicated around hydrogen and not the product itself. Go ahead, Aaron. Thanks, Andre and Michael. And I have the pleasure of closing us out with a final slide on the, uh, the implications of what Antonio already mentioned, the fact that hydrogen will be uh, covered only for its direct emissions and not its indirect emissions. Um, this 
doesn't have particularly important impacts for fossil fuel based hydrogen, which, as Antonio mentioned, is the only type of hydrogen already produced in Europe or practically the only type of hydrogen already produced in Europe. But it is relevant for future production of hydrogen from electrolyzers, which will have a high electricity use and high indirect emissions. For those producers, if indirect, if indirect emissions are not covered, there would be, we note in the report, a risk of leakage because they have, those producers have high electricity prices relative to potential competitors elsewhere in the world. Um, this, this dynamic is discussed in more detail in our recent report uh, of last year on indirect emissions in the CBAM, but basically it boils down to the fact that um, electricity prices for uh, those hydrogen producers will be inflated both by the fact that the electricity producers have to pay for uh, their emissions under the ETS and also by the fact that the, the curious quirk of the EU electricity market, the prices charged for uh, purchasers of electricity are, are charged at the uh, marginal cost of producers and typically those are high emitting producers, even if the actual grid is relatively clean. The, uh, we're not going to go into those weeds at this point, if you're interested, go read the report, but the final, the uptake is uh, there's a risk of leakage because these producers will be paying high costs for electricity higher than those paid by their competitors. I'm going to take a little side note here to note, and this is important. This is a different, you know, we've said this throughout, hydrogen is different. This is a different concept of leakage and, and similarly circumvention, which Michael talked about, than we have talked about for other products, because typically we're talking about the uh, leakage is the loss, the, the, the response to EU uh, regulations, climate-based regulations uh, of an increase in emissions elsewhere uh, in other jurisdictions, and it can be a relocation of existing production or a diversion of greenfield investment, whatever, a loss of markets. Here we're not talking about that actually, because there are no existing producers, right? We're talking about the uh, the potential implications for future producers of renewable uh, uh, electric re renewable electricity sourced hydrogen. It's actually a very different concept, and it could be argued not uh, so much environmental as uh, based on competitiveness concerns. Anyway, little side trip. Um, the because the because of, the, of those competitiveness and, and leakage implications hydrogen producers are uh instead of being covered by indirect uh, their indirect costs or indirect emissions they're being offered uh indirect cost compensation from, from the member states there's a possibility for member states to give them cost compensation for the indirect costs that they pay by purchasing such high priced electricity. This is the same uh, deal that has also been offered to aluminum producers, iron and steel producers, which also do not have their indirect emissions costs covered under the CBAM. Just quickly, a couple of pros and cons to that, uh, that proposition, that is covering them with indirect cost compensation, protecting them that way, instead of protecting them by uh, covering indirect costs under the CBAM. The, the major pro is that it reduces the risk of resource shuffling. Again, refer to some of our previous reports, um, but uh, it, it, Mike, as Michael mentioned, this is, this is the process by which you can ship, uh, simply shuffle around your existing production if you're a foreign producer, send the, the stuff that was produced with clean electricity to the EU, send the stuff that was produced with dirty electricity elsewhere. Very important consideration for aluminum and iron and steel. Again, for hydrogen, it's important in the future, uh, not so much now. The cons to this particular scheme are that first, indirect cost compensation is not granted by all member states. It is an option under state aid rules that they can grant that. Um, secondly, that the indirect cost compensation is not necessarily tied to actual carbon costs in a number of ways. We don't have time to go into the details here, but it may over or undercompensate the covered firms. There is, if if you work it that way, uh, thirdly, there is no incentive for foreign producers to decarbonize their production because they're not being charged for their indirect emissions, minor consideration. And finally, another uh, sort of uh, interesting consideration, as the production of renewably uh, electricity sourced hydrogen ramps up in the EU to the 10 megatons envisioned, as Antonio said, costs to the member states will increase uh, uh, proportionately because they will have to be covering the indirect costs cover, incurred by those producers. I, I leave it at that. Uh, it's a funny way to close out the discussion, but I'm looking forward to the ensuing discussion and the, oh. and the comments.
Thanks, uh, thanks, Aaron. So, it, in, if in, in uh, pre-allocation and CBAM is being resolved because we know which way we're going, which one do you want? Do you want indirect cost compensation, or do you want uh, CBAM to include indirect costs? You know, you have the risk of being able to measure the footprint somewhere else, or you have the uh, ability to lobby your own people to give you indirect cost compensation. No, that's reality. That's what we're living in. What what is the risk that you can deal with? We are not at 15, we're at 45, <laughs> but you, I know that you are. You have a soft spot for us that will excuse us. Okay, well, first of all, thank you for, for the invitation once more. I mean, it's always a pleasure discussing with people who are so knowledgeable about these, these issues. And I want to thank you also for launching the debate so early also on, on hydrogen, uh, which I think it's important that we all engage. And as we could see from the presentations, there are many questions that still to be to be solved. I don't come with all the solutions, of course. This is the departure point. Olivier was saying this was a big surprise that hydrogen was included. I suppose I have to say it was a surprise, but to a certain extent, because the parliament was pushing for, for the introduction of a lot of sectors. And one of the sectors that they were pushing quite a lot was in particular hydrogen. So in the in the trilogues, it was very clear from the beginning that the parliament was very keen on, on the inclusion of hydrogen. We, we didn't include hydrogen at the very beginning because, as you know, the, and it has been explained, uh, the tradeability with hydrogen is very low at this stage. I mean, and I think that you mentioned that only 10% is merged on hydrogen or 20% or less than 20%? 10%. So, 10%, so it's really very, very low. But of course, as we know, bless you. But as we know, the importations of hydrogen will increase and you refer to the hydrogen strategy but also because we want to rely more and more on hydrogen as a way to do this clean transition and also to move away from, from fossil fuels. In particular, we produce hydrogen from, from renewables. So to a certain extent, it's not so, such a surprise because if we see, for example, that we included electricity from the beginning and there was not so much discussion why we are including electricity when we are not importing so much electricity at this stage, Again, you could use the same narrative and say, yeah, well, not much now, but of course we can expect that will increase. And at the same time, of course, with the CBAM, what we want to promote is green electricity, green hydrogen. So I think that uh, we, we can find the, the answer why hydrogen is included in the, in the scope. We also thought that uh, also in terms of intensity, carbon intensity, uh, depending on the route, that you use for the production of hydrogen. Of course, we, we can speak about higher or lower in intensities, but as said before, currently most of the hydrogen is produced from, from fossil fuels. So the intensity is also very high. So we have the two components, higher tradability in the future, high in carbon intensity, and the fact that we want to promote imports of green hydrogen, well, that gives the equation and the answer why we would like to include also hydrogen in the, in the scope. The importance of hydrogen will be will be higher and higher. Okay, we will have to look at that during the next years, how the market will be evolving. I think that you raised the point about also substitutability with other products. You mentioned the impact or lower uh, prices on fossil fuels. I mean, I suppose that if my mother were listening to you, she would not be complaining. She would not understand what you said, but coming from tax suit, I can understand, yes. Lower prices put a lot of uh, problems on greener solutions and also on energy consumption. So the higher the prices, the less consumption and a push for, for greener greener solutions. So, but then we have other solutions. I also I am also responsible of the energy taxation directive. So we can we can use other ways to, to try to find the balance with the with the price, with the final price after after taxes. But yes, surprise because we didn't propose it, um, but it was part of the discussions between parliament and council and in the last trilogue where there was a decision on the sectors and hydrogen was in included. Also some precursors, a very limited number of precursors for steel and aluminum in particular, and also well, what we call downstream products, but actually they are really uh, products which are made of 90, 90, or even above 90% of steel or aluminum. Like for example, the fasteners. I mean, the bolts, nails, uh, nuts, and all these type of products, or cutlery, for example, forks, knives made of, of steel or, or aluminium. So that's a bit the reason why we get here and why hydrogen is in the in the scope. 
So now it's in the scope. So now we have to work with that. I'm happy to work with that. Uh, of course, if every product is single in, in, in itself, uh, aluminum has nothing to do with steel, and electricity is another different uh, element. Now we add the complexity, of course, of hydrogen, uh, as you as you raised in the in the different presentations. But that's something, of course, that we need to to get right in the next in the next months. And we count on the help of everyone, on the experts, on like you, but also, of course, Hydrogen Europe and the producers of hydrogen in order to to get it right. Now the challenges are to define what I call the how, the when, and the what. I mean, uh, you already referred to that. How, there are different routes for the production of hydrogen, so we need to differentiate. We need to understand the different routes, and we need to differentiate also the treatment of hydrogen according to the, to the different routes. So we have gray hydrogen, but we have also blue, pink, yellow, and green hydrogen. As I said before, we want, of course, to promote the, the green hydrogen. I think the yellow is the one made from solar. So it's also a sort of green hydrogen. Uh, but of course, um, there are a lot of different routes uh, with CCU, with CCS, without, I mean, there are of course different different ways and we need to get it right. So we need to know the boundaries for assessing the missions and we need to understand uh, the different types of production. The when, you mentioned the problem with carriers or with derivatives. Hydrogen can be imported as a gas through a pipe, like natural gas, um, which is, I mean, which is pipe borne. I mean, that's an easy one, maybe. But you said, as you said, this is only for short haul or for short distance. Maybe in the future we will have more and more compressed liquid. I understand that you need very low temperatures in order to to make it liquid. So that's also another another challenge. But anyway, I mean, there there will be ways, of course, to import more and more in the form of liquid, and very usually uh, in combination with other products. As you know, uh, CBAN will rely like on import procedures on HS codes or CN codes. And therefore, when they will be imported, they will not be imported as hydrogen. So that's, a, that's of course, a challenge for us in order to be able to, to make sure that we catch all hydrogen. Also, the hydrogen that has been imported, for example, with an L LOHC. So the question will be when, at the moment of the importation or at the moment when we disassociate the hydrogen from the carrier, because as you know, the carrier will go back, but the hydrogen will be will be staying. So that that's of course going to be another challenge because for the rest of the products, it's easier when they come to the border. We identify the products, but here there will be a challenge with uh, identifying the the products. But that's something that we are of course trying to to solve, and we we will need to look at. And then the other question is what what type of emissions? You mentioned before that for the gray hydrogen. We are talking mainly about direct emissions, which are in the scope currently in the scope of the of the regulation or in the scope of the of the CBAM. Indirect emissions are also in the scope, but not for those sectors. To be clear, among us, those sectors will receive the compensation for indirect cost. So that means that gray hydrogen or most of the emissions from the green gray hydrogen production will be in the scope, while in principle, in the case of electrolytic. Uh, hydrogen, the indirect emissions will be more relevant and in principle would not be within the scope. But again, as you said uh, rightly before, we, we need to produce a report before the end of the transitional period in which we will analyze and assess also the possibility of including indirect emissions for all seven sectors and not only for, for example, fertilizers and and cement, which are the ones which uh, now have uh, indirect emissions within the scope also in the in the CBAM. But that will be linked, of course, to the discussions on the market electricity design. As you know, there will be a proposal of the Commission at the end of March or in two weeks. On the 16th, actually. Yeah, in two weeks. So in two weeks. Uh, more or less, less than two weeks, possibly. So we we need to look at this. That's something, of course, that we are discussing internally. And, and, and then I think that the more we move to, of course, green hydrogen, we will need to take into account also, of course, the, the indirect emissions. So what we are doing now, as you know, the transitional period will kick in on the 1st of October. And as you know, for this transitional period until the end of 2025, it will be only a 
a dry run, collecting data. This data will help us to get all these questions answered and to get things right with your support. And I count on all of you and your brains to, to help us to identify the best way to solve these problems of how, when, and what. And of course, by the end of the transitional period, we need to report on the extension of the scope to other sectors. Uh, the agreement between Parliament and Council was to include all sectors at risk of carbon leakage in the ETS before 2030 or by 2030 at the latest, but based on some sort of analysis and, of course, on some benchmarks and, and criteria to include, and also with some sort of, of timetable time and, and schedule. We will also need to analyze what I said about indirect emissions, direct and indirect emissions, of course, that's that's important. And we will also, of course, look at other aspects, which, for example, for the Council were very important, like the impacts on competitiveness. You also mentioned the question of uh, how all this and the fact that free allo allocation will be gone also, of course, for the production of hydrogen, how this will affect the competitiveness of the production of hydrogen, in particular low carbon hydrogen in the EU with respect to the imports from the countries. And then you also mentioned this impact or this effect of substitutability between hydrogen and, and other fuels. So these are the type of course of things that we are going to have to reflect in the in the report. And the report will have to be adopted before before the end of the of 2025. So that means that it has to be produced tomorrow. We don't have much time. So basically, this is what I wanted to say. I mean, I don't add anything new to what has been said by all your colleagues, but at least I can confirm that we are aware of all these challenges. We are working on them. Uh, we, we are also defining the methodology for all the C1 sectors, uh, including also the hydrogen. Since the transitional period will start in October, we, we need to come with an implementing act possibly around May, June, June, more than May, uh, in order to, to come with the reporting obligations and also some sort of procedures to assess embedded emissions. It will not be the final methodology because the methodology for the CBAM will be released or the final methodology will be released uh, before the end of the transitional period. But uh, at, at least it will give us some sort of parameters and, and procedures in order to account emissions, direct and indirect emissions, for the dry run until the end of the, of the transitional period. Um, we are working on the methodology with an external expert. We have uh, also set up uh, an expert group where we try to be transparent and also well I mean, um, open to, to third countries. Uh, some countries have asked to be observers and they are already part of the, of the group. And we, we want to come with some sort of preliminary analysis or assessment of how uh, embedded emissions could be, could be assessed for the, for the reporting obligations in the, during the transitional period. And I think that with this, I can stop. And not before telling us when we're going to get the regulation. Uh, yeah, that's true. I forgot that. Uh, there was the agreement in the trilogue in December, but because of international in, internal procedures in both Parliament and Council, because they need to go through some sort of uh, approvals, uh, there might be a vote in the Parliament in the middle of April. I don't remember now the date. I think it's around the 20, mm -hmm. 20s ish. And then the council, I think it will be the Agri Council at the beginning of May, which will adopt also the regulation. That means that the shake, hands shaking put, took place maybe on Schumann's Day, on the 9th or on the 10th of May. So I hope that by the beginning of May, we will have also the regulation adopted. And the delay has nothing to do with the proposal. It's because... Well, first, the internal procedures that I mentioned, corporate council discussions, and also in the MV committee, which already voted at the beginning of February, and then the the, the final vote in the in the plenary. But also because jurist linguists need a lot of time to understand and to get it right. I have to say that they are doing a terrific job because, of course, 
uh, when you decide things at five o'clock in the morning in Strasbourg in the last trilogue, not always, you don't always pay attention to the coherence between the different articles. So that's a work which has been done now by the Jewish linguist, but there is already a final, final text. So in principle, yeah, beginning of May, hopefully we should have the regulation. That has put some delay on our implementing act that I mentioned before, and this is why we cannot come with implementing act before, before the month of June. We want to engage in a big, large outreach exercise with EU industry, also with importers, with producers in third countries, with administrations in third countries. Unfortunately, we have to do that once the regulation will be adopted and we will have also the implementing act with the reporting obligations. But I mean, we are planning now, we are working on the plans and we should be able to launch that from June and before October. So there will be training modules on the internet. There will be videos explaining everything. So I think that there will be a lot of material that will be shared with everyone. I hope that uh, everyone will find it uh, sufficient and illustrative and helpful in order to be able to, to apply CIVAM from, from October. Thank you, uh, Vicente. Uh, let me go to, to the uh, the panelists that they will also probably be the first one to have the opportunity to raise direct issue with it. I am not in a in a in a uh, in the mood to massacre names, but some of them are more difficult than others. Hmm. I will try. Marina Hritsishina. Yes, thank you. I got it close enough from hydrogenous. So please go ahead. Uh, my name is Marina Hritsishina. I'm a senior manager at Career Affairs. Thank you for invitation to this discussion. Uh, uh, Marina, I think we've got like 130, uh, 40 people on that. So can you hear me? Uh, yeah. Uh, I work in Hydrogenous LHC, and uh, today we have heard a lot of uh, questions about exception of uh, uh, hydrogen careers, so like uh, LHC technology. And uh, I would like to explain uh, the sense uh, of this technology and uh, um, the key topic that uh, LHC cannot be subject to CBAM. Uh, first of all, because LHC is a substance that we use for transportation of hydrogen. Uh, but when we use LHC for hydrogen, uh, for hydrogen transportation, it doesn't mean that uh, this substance with hydrogen will be imported goods in case of hydrogen import. Uh, we just use the substance in case of hydrogen, yes, it's a bit in order to uh, upload hydrogen and then release it in the place of delivery, for instance, in the port or in some other place in the EU. It means that uh, it, LHC in any case will be used for transportation, but as um, vessels or some other um, uh, solution for transportation of hydrogen. So I propose for this reason to exclude this topic about uh, LHC as uh, hydrogen career that should be also subject to CBAM, because in any case, when you use LHC, hydrogen will be subject to CBAM. Uh, you just need to clarify the topic connected with custom regulation for LHC technology that will be uh, used uh, in case of transportation. And I, I should also mention that when we use LHC, we use um, benzone a lot of times, so it uh, will be uh, transported between storage plant and release plant thousands of times in closed conditions without transfer to third parties. It means that uh, clients or customers will not uh, have possibility to receive this uh, substance like uh, goods uh, in case of supply, some other goods, for instance. And the last uh, arguments that confront that LHC cannot be subject to CBAM uh, that we do not have a transfer of title on this substance with hydrogen. We transfer only hydrogen to the clients or to the customers. Uh, LHC will not be transferred. It will be used by uh, the companies that will uh, transport this hydrogen uh, between different countries. So it's the main uh, argument from my side. And if you have uh, some other questions regarding the use of LHC and application of CBAM, I will be happy to answer. And I can say also several comments regarding supply chain. When we discuss supply chain for hydrogen transportation, we have a lot of questions with CBAM and especially calculation of possible uh, payments connected with uh, CBAM, that it's also very important to qualify in the future for future projects because it's not clear now the pilot stage. Thank you for your attention, and I'll be happy to answer your questions. Very well, Marina. Thank you very much. Uh, talking about hydrogen, you mentioned hydrogen Europe. We've made uh, quite a um, an effort to make sure that we work together with our colleagues in in hydrogen Europe. 
So uh, Gregor uh, uh, Pavelik, Hydrogen Europe Director for Intelligence, go ahead, please. Yes, uh, good afternoon, everyone. So uh, thank you for having me, and I'm um, so very well, kind of grateful that you have invited us to to have this conversation because uh, yeah, it's timely and and quite needed. Uh, well, our position or SIBAM was and on inclusion of hydrogen in it was usually and so far we are rather on the position that it should not be included at all. Uh, from the point of view that uh, indeed the trade of it is relatively low, so we, currently you can import the dirtiest hydrogen to Europe and don't pay a penny on it, and no one does it. So why then include it? Because if import in the future will come, it will be import of the low carbon variety, uh, and if you if the red requires you to even calculate the CO2 from transport of it, the production portion will probably be even well below the red threshold, so it will be close to zero anyway. So why bother? It just creates additional burden uh, if we indeed end up with having a different methodology to calculate the CO2 footprint than we have in red, that we will have in, in the uh, you know, gas package, than there is in the taxonomy, so that kind of creates a lot of additional administrative burden, let's say, for very little added value because we don't see it as a uh, as a tool that's needed to prevent, uh, you know, CO2 intensive hydrogen being imported to Europe because the, the risk of that happening is low because it would have happened today if it would indeed be a, be a, be a risk. Uh, so that, that was our initial position. But again, if it's there, then it's there. Uh, so we need to make sure that it's uh, implemented in a way that's as uh, as straightforward and as manageable to the sector as possible, right? So, uh, so that's already somehow uh, ensured. And 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 from that point of view, I think uh, from our point of view, there are two extremely important issues in the debate. One is uh, that if hydrogen is there, uh, then uh, we need to ensure whether we do not create some kind of distortion between different hydrogen carriers. Uh, then we can import hydrogen indeed as hydrogen uh, uh, and with LHC, we can import it directly, we can import it as methanol or as ammonia, for example. And there is some discussion now whether, okay, you, you have CBAN for pure hydrogen with, without indirect uh, emissions. Uh, if you import as, as ammonia, you, you also have to include indirect emissions. Uh, if you import as methanol, you don't have CBAM at all. So there is a discussion there to be had uh what is the best course of action there not to create a distortion somehow uh, and distortion of the competitiveness of various solutions but on the other hand we also see a, a risk on, on going too far i mean including methanol or other uh, aromatic chemicals would be also yeah. another challenge to to do that uh, so we probably would not want that either so there is a fine line to uh, and fine balance to strike and the second important issue for us is indeed the ensuring that the additional burden in terms of calculating the CO2 to emissions is as little as possible. Because if indeed we, we want to promote the low carbon hydrogen uh, and the renewable hydrogen, and this will be imported in order to comply with red targets, and maybe there will be some targets for low carbon, who knows? Uh, People will have to comply with those targets by calculating the footprint in accordance to those methodologies. So it would be probably best if uh, the divergence of those various approaches would be as, as little as possible so that it wouldn't be you know, entirely two different approaches to calculate CO2, uh, because that would just create a, a burden. So those, those would be probably the two most important issues from our point. Uh, Gregor, thank you. Um... Let's move on to uh, the steel industry. It's been mentioned a few times. Uh, Julian Scott. I brought her. Yeah. Sorry. Thank you. I actually I, I got the Regina. I didn't get I didn't get the short back. To be honest, also that's good. I I understand. No, many thanks for having me. Um, so I work for Tristan Group Steel, which is Germany's biggest flat steel producer. And why are we sitting here at this table? Um, because we will be one of the major hydrogen consumers huh? only in a few years. Mm -hmm. Just last week, you might have read it in the press. If you're a German speaker, it was a bit more in the German press than in the English speaking press, but there were press uh, coverage. We ordered our first direct reduction plant. Huh? So the new climate-friendly steel production facility 
for worth more than 2 billion euros, the oil, and the plant will be operational in 2026. We'll run it at the beginning with uh, natural gas, of course, and then we will phase in hydrogen very quickly. In 2028, we should be at 100% hydrogen. And we will need for this first plan in 2030, four terawatt hours of hydrogen. So this basically means uh, you can do the calculations on your own. It basically means 120,000 tons per year. That's a lot. Mm -hmm. And so we are very much interested in the hydrogen market <clears throat> ramp up. Uh, for us, it's decisive that we get this market up as soon as possible. And I think uh, many other energy intensive industries are exactly in the same situation, yeah, the chemical industry, but also other metal producers. So we really need this um, climate friendly hydrogen in order to succeed in our transformation to yeah, CO2 reduced production. Um, that's why I have to be a bit more political than some of the other speakers. I think. Um, Yes, it was a surprise, but it was, uh, from our perspective, a very bad surprise and very bad news for all energy intensive, energy intensive and consumers of hydrogen. To be honest, um, it's not in the report, and I completely get it. It's it's not a political report, but we all, I think, know why it was included at the end. It was not falling from the heaven. Eh? Or we all know who lobbied for it, and I think it is clear that the main target is to set up trade barriers. Yeah. So those who pushed for it are companies producing hydrogen in Europe and wanting to prevent um, hydrogen imports from abroad from third countries. That's, that's a very bad uh, approach from our perspective. Um, so basically, it's, it's, it's hampering uh, hydrogen trade globally. And um, yeah, this is, of course, as I said, for companies in need of large volumes of hydrogen, also at affordable prices, it's a big, a big challenge. As I said, we are setting up, we're building this plant. Um, we will produce more than 2 million tons of green steel then with this plant. And uh, since this is already tomorrow, uh, we are already negotiating our hydrogen supply. I can tell you that the prices we are getting offered are excessively high, especially for European production. I can also tell you, because it was also mentioned in some of the introductory remarks, Despite the high natural gas prices, for instance, blue hydrogen is still much more cost competitive than green hydrogen. Currently, of course, we all hope this, this will change, but currently, from an end user perspective, it's, it's clearly the case. Yeah, When you go into the green hydrogen prices, you're, always, you're often, um, let's say, around two-digit euro prices per kilogram. And um, uh, blue hydrogen, it's, 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 uh, it's much, much cheaper, we have to say. So, why do I underline that? I underline this because this means that in a transitional period, at least, the energy intensive industry in Europe will need blue hydrogen. Yeah? We will need a mixture of green and blue, and perhaps even other low carbon types of hydrogen. And including, of course, hydrogen in the CBAM makes blue hydrogen imports much more burdensome. And also, in many cases, it's likely that it will become more costly. <clears throat> um, so, from our perspective, we have, let's say, two challenges. The first one is political. I think, okay, we now have to work with the fact that uh, hydrogen is in the CBAM scope, but we also have to be clear our regulation can be changed. There will be a new commission next year. There will be a transitional period. So why can't we take hydrogen out again until 2026? I think with Hydrogen Europe, for instance, and other actors who are really interested in bringing the hydrogen market forward, um, we should try to get that uh, done politically. The second uh, challenge is then more technical, and that's, I think, what we want to mainly uh, discuss today. It's if it's included and if it remains included in scope, how can we implement it in a manner which is not setting up these trade barriers that I, barriers that I mentioned? And I think um, uh, my colleague from Hydrogen Europe already gave a few, let's say, a few um, um, ideas. Um, I think... Um, what is really crucial, what will be really crucial, is that at least for the hydrogen um, that fulfills the other, let's say, regulatory requirements that are also mentioned in the ERCST report, there should be a special treatment. So if somebody complies with the delegated act on RFMBOs regarding additionality, temporal correlation, geographical correlation, and all the other requirements, and it's a certified red compliant hydrogen, it should have a preferential treatment within the CBAM uh, framework. That's very clear. And the same should be the case for blue hydrogen, for which we will also have a regulatory uh, framework set up. 
as we'd also already mentioned, within the um, gas and hydrogen package, yeah, there will also be another delegated act. So I think this is this is then um, our second um, priority. I think on the um, free allocation issue, uh, just to mention it because you you discussed it a lot in your report, I, I I don't see a major issue with that. I think we should all focus on the green and low carbon hydrogen production of the future, and I think our assessment should be based on the question. What will be the impact on green hydrogen producers in Europe? And basically, the free allocation you would get as a green hydrogen producer is very limited or will be very limited. And so we did a calculation, um, for instance, and from our calculations show that some will be perhaps 60 euro cents or 40 euro cents per kilogram of hydrogen. So compared to what you get in the US with the IRA, it's really uh, ridiculously low. So I don't think that the issue of phasing out free allocation um, for, for green hydrogen producers is, is, is really um, impacting the competitiveness of, 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 those, of those companies. So we shouldn't worry that much about that. On circumvention, okay, I, I get the point. I think what we should not do, not do, of course, is include other types of hydrogen or other hydrogen um, carriers in the CBAM. I think you get, I got why I argue like this. We should not set, set up other barriers for hydrogen imports. Um, yeah, and on the issue you also raised in your report, um, hydrogen competing with other energy carriers, fuels, et cetera, of course, from the, sec from the perspective of the steel industry, we will need hydrogen. Yeah, there's no way that we just electrify our production. This will also happen. It will be more scrap-based secondary steel production, but we will still need primary steel production. It will be based on hydrogen. So um, for us, there is no chance to just switch to another feedstock or fuel. And I would stop here. Thanks. Uh, I have a question no, for Yeah, go ahead. Please. Please. He mentioned that there should be a special treatment for gray and blue. What do you mean? Uh, for green, green and blue. Green, green. Okay. Say gray, sorry. No, I understood. <laughs> <laughs> no, not at all, but Cray. Eh? <laughs> I'm talking to Spanish. <laughs> it can be difficult. No, uh, what, what do you mean by special treatment in the in the Sivan? You, you mean a different treatment from the rest of the sectors? Exactly. I think it's only uh, creative thinking. Huh? It's not. Uh... I love the creative. <laughs> Whoever may have some creative thinking, send it to us. Yeah, yeah. But if you look at how the Sivan will be implemented in general, of course, there will be uh, first of all a lot of reporting obligations. Where you could foresee some, let's say, simplifications for for green and blue hydrogen certified according to the EU rules. That's the first, I think, uh, uh, approach that we could take. The second one thing I think is, and I think Hydrogen Europe also referred to it uh, implicitly. Um, I think if hydrogen is produced according to the EU rules, there should be no there should be no CBAM obligation to be paid. Simply, yeah. So we should tweak the methodology in a sense that allows a producer to import red certified hydrogen into Europe without being obliged to pay a CBAM levy. That's that's also mm -hmm. one idea we have. Huh? Yeah. Of course, it's tricky to implement it at the end, but honestly, let's keep in mind why we force this hydrogen market ramp up. It's not because we want to make anybody happy producing hydrogen. It's for climate policy reasons. Yeah, mm -hmm. We want to decarbonize. So our main target should be to have sufficient volumes of climate-friendly hydrogen available in Europe. That's something we should always keep in mind when we design regulation from our perspective. Okay. Thanks. Peter, Peter, I think, Peter Bocic, you have your hands up. I think you don't mean to do that, I don't suspect, <laughs> because I'm trying to promote you, but you're, you're refusing to be promoted. Uh, Gregor? Uh, no, no, I just wanted to basically uh, set this so, <laughs> so that when we're talking about how to promote the red uh, compliant hydrogen in, in, in CBAM, uh, is, uh, again, I mean, even if we don't want to uh, exclude it, if that would be tricky to implement, that it wouldn't have to pay anything, I mean, just accepting the same footprint of CO2 that is for the on the red certificate, for the CBAM obligation without going through any additional steps of additional certification, additional calculation, just taking whatever is there for the CBAM as well, uh, that's already a good step in the right, the right direction, I think. Thanks, uh, thanks, Gregor. Let me, let me move on to, to Pauline Mathieu from Electricité de France. Yes, thank you. Hi, uh, thank you for the invitation. I'm happy to discuss the outcomes of your report. 
Uh, actually, I find it really good. It gives a good overview of the hydrogen uh, market, uh, the nation's hydrogen market, and its anticipation for the future. Uh, and it also raises a lot of questions. And I think we all agree there that uh, there we have a lot of questions. Uh, how and it shows how it's gonna be. Yeah, we have to work for the development of the hydrogen market and also for its protection. So yeah, I'm Pauline. I work for EDF, uh, EU European Department. Uh, we are the largest deca electricity, decarbonized electricity producer in Europe, but we are also very much implied with hydrogen production. We have a dedicated subsidiary, uh, which is called Hynomix, and which develops projects of hydrogen. For example, we have a project uh, to supply buses in France um, with hydrogen. We also have a uh, project of uh, producing e-methanol to 200,000 tons of e-methanol per year. Um, this is also in France. We also have projects in Germany, for example, uh, we uh, complementing a, a refinery. So we are very much implied in that and we look closely to, to, yeah, to this regulation. Um, you ask from a producer perspective, what do, what do we want? And I think I will agree with Vincente uh, and Julia and maybe yeah, Gregors, uh, we were we weren't in favor of of including the CBAM, uh, including the hydrogen in the CBAM at least for now. Uh, but let's work with it. And I think maybe this would be my main message: um, is we have to decorrelate short term and long term protection of the market. Um, and I'll explain. I'll explain why. Uh, from producer perspective, we have two big challenges. Uh, this is certification. We need a fair certification based on GHG emission reduction and coherent uh, among the legislation. Uh, you showed in the report that we have uh, lots of definition and that's good. I think it's a good ongoing process, but we have to remain coherent. Uh, second thing is loving level playing field. Uh, how can CBAM help in that? You also say in your report that CBAM is actually just a small part of protecting the market because it just uh, protects us from the carbon cost of hydrogen when we actually have uh, lots of different costs. So on certification, uh, I think, and I would agree with you, uh, we, we need to be coherent with what, we, what will be asked from RED and the gas directive. And that is gonna be way stricter than what asks CBAM. And in this sense, I agree with you. I think, uh, and it was also in the note uh, written by Umweltbundesamt mm -hmm. uh, and uh, Ricardo. Um, it was it was written that one one option could be to use this red certification as a CBAM passport mm -hmm. because all the reason we all the reason we we mentioned um, if it is red certified, it means there is a level of emission reduction, but it also means additionality. It means correlation. And it means renewable. So renewable will be counted as zero. So they wouldn't be able, like they wouldn't have to pay the, the carbon cost. Mm -hmm. So that would be one, one first thing. Uh, second thing uh, on level playing fields, uh, and you also asked about free uh, indirect cost compensation. I agree also with Julian that uh, free allowances are not that much of a problem because it, it plays a small part in, in business plans. Uh, indirect cost compensation, on the contrary, <laughs> Yeah, play a big role in in our business plans, in our projects, and that's why uh, it's a, it's a real dilemma. Um, we understand the need to include uh, scrap two indirect em emission for for hydrogen in the CBAM, but if you look at what is going to be imported in the like in the short term, it's going to be really a few like not a lot of hydrogen, and what will be imported will be driven by red, so it's going to be renewable hydrogen. So we won't need uh, indirect emission, like to, to count indirect emission because there is gonna, like the market will be driven by, by the red incentives. So we would, we, we are really against the inclusion of uh, indirect emission from now, for now in the CBAM because the market will be driven by red. So imports will be renewable hydrogen. So indirect emission won't count. And because it's gonna, uh, yeah, remove indirect cost compensation for us, which are really a big part of our business plans and which would just be crucial for, for our project. And um, on on that, um, I, <laughs> I think uh, I forgot what I wanted to 
to say but I had a lot of <laughs> different things because lots of interesting things were said da, da, da. um yeah and anyway um I think these two big challenges uh certification and level playing field um they are they are the two main things and again we have to differentiate between short term uh short term we are really in competition with fossil hydrogen mm -hmm. within the EU market and that's why we need all the support we can get it comes from indirect cost compensation it also comes from a valuable premium for example from all the financial and political incentives we can get from the net zero industrial act also and in the longer term when CBAM, uh, when hydrogen will be more imported, when will, the market will have grown, when our production of hydrogen will be also more mature, there we can think of including more indirect emission, for example, to protect us from the import and from, from the non-EU countries. But yeah. Mm -hmm. What would be the advantage, sorry, uh, Pauline, if at some point in the future, in the, in, in the future, sometime in the future, you would have mostly all renewable hydrogen. So the advantage at that point of including it, including indirect cost, uh, including uh, indirect mm -hmm. cost emissions, in, indirect emissions, how how would that work? Because if it's all in, it's all renewable hydrogen, mm -hmm. there is no. Yeah, if it's all renewable, I agree with you. Uh, we we don't need to to include indirect emission because it's going to count zero emission anyway. Uh, the thing is if like big industrial in in Europe need also more than than that, and if the renewable production is not um, enough to to just supply this demand, then uh, there is a risk of of actually greenwashing. Uh, if you say, yeah, my electricity is uh, renewable, and if you don't, if you if you over the red uh, targets. And you don't have to comply with red because your your industry already complies with uh, what is asked by red. Then you could have a risk of greenwashing, and that's where uh, indirect emissions are. But I you think is a disconnect between indirect cost and indirect emissions. Huh? You can have a very sliver left of yeah. uh, mm -hmm. emitting, and the full electricity cost is burdened. So mm -hmm. it really has to be fully gone. But maybe using the red certification is a way to over, like overcome this, this thing of scope one, scope two. If you use red certification as CBAM pass, then you don't have to think of direct emission or indirect emission because you have a large uh, set of criteria you have to respect. Then you don't have to uh, work with CBAM anymore and you can keep indirect cost compensation while avoiding greenwashing mm -hmm. because you respect the criteria. Yeah, I mean, that would simplify things for sure. I mean, if you have a certification process, then it's easier to apply. The problem is that CBAN is not constructed like that because we are facing completely or we are mirroring completely the ETS. Yeah. So we look at the actual emissions. So for us, it makes a difference whether it's greener or less, less green. Mm -hmm. So it's not you are green or you are not green. It's a question of how many emissions are embedded in the production. And there, there are two things. One thing is if in the future we'll be all importing green, okay, we don't need seven. But another thing is that in the future we'll be importing electrolytic hydrogen. That's different because it can be green or not, mm -hmm. depending on how you produce the electricity. And this is why at that moment, of course, when we will be all importing electrolytic hydrogen, we need to have indirect emissions. Otherwise, you don't catch, of course. That you don't catch it. So we need to get it solved. I mean, I, we understand because we discuss a lot about the production of aluminium. So, and there I learned a lot about indirect cost and indirect emissions. So we are aware of the problem and you can see why the solution has been what it has been. Uh, but I think that there might be ways to deal with that. Not all countries, not all member states have the compensation. That's the first thing. But we need a common approach. I mean, we cannot differentiate whether you import in France or you are importing in Finland or in Spain. So we, we need to have a common, common approach and we need to find a solution. I mean, I have some ideas, but since we are not under Chantar, okay, we'll leave it for another for another day. We will leave it for I another day. Was good. I thought I was doing a good thing. Maybe, maybe. Let's keep the interest, not for another. <laughs> <laughs> this is like, yeah, this is like, like Rocky too. Okay, uh, Luke. Yes. Um, First of all, I want to thank for the report. Uh, I think this is one of the reports 
where our uh, organization would like to see more of it. There are lots of think tanks writing lots of reports, but this is definitely an area which is under investigated. So uh, yes, this is the first report. Please write a more in-depth version and continue on this path <laughs> because it's so complex and it's really important. Uh, so as Yara, I'm sitting here a little bit uh, with several hats if I compare to the other uh, speakers, uh, because we're indeed, uh, we're European industry, um, European industry uh, exporting heavily as a company and so still very uh, much into this export competitiveness topic. Uh, as ammonia producer in Europe, uh, we produce about 7% of Europe's hydrogen, so we're also on the top of, of that list. As, uh, the, the, as shown uh, in the presentation, and uh, as largest ammonia trader by far worldwide, uh, we're of, of course also looking at this opportunity now to import clean hydrogen in the shape of clean ammonia. Uh, when we when we look at it um, from now this specific hydrogen topic, um, we were not having any strong opinion about whether hydrogen should be included or sh should not be included. Uh, but we think it's really important that now that it's decided to include it, that it's done correctly. And that's about how to make sure that hydrogen forms when shipped to Europe compete on an equal basis. And an equal basis means that they are indeed uh, assessed on their real carbon footprint and not on technicalities, whether the product comes in via pipeline and is electrolytic hydrogen and therefore doesn't have indirect emissions and therefore doesn't have a carbon footprint or comes in uh, as methanol is out of sebum and doesn't have a carbon footprint or comes in as hydrogen and then uh, has uh, uh, no indirect emissions, uh, but then depends on the shape whether how much it has or comes in as ammonia has uh, indirect emissions included and then you need to decide whether if you crack it back to hydrogen whether it's then hydrogen like LOHC hydrogen or uh, ammonia hydrogen and um, fundamentally uh, there we should follow more indeed the logic of the, um, the renewable energy um, reform and, and the gas package that we try to look at okay what makes sense from a carbon footprint uh, reduction for imports because we're indeed, we're not importing gray hydrogen. This is about this transition. We're trying to develop an emerging market and we're trying to find the most efficient ways from a climate perspective and from a business perspective to get that hydrogen uh, into Europe. Um, the, uh, the, the topic of uh, RFNBO certification, we were also thinking, I think we're there very well aligned. Uh, from a practical standpoint, as both importer and project developer abroad, we have been struggling a lot uh, with our investment partners, not knowing for sure what standards we had to comply with for RFNBO. In a similar way, we're now already looking at the implementation and we source ammonia also from third parties, and we certainly have a new burden that we have to impose on them monitoring, verification, reporting. Um, and that's a contractual obligation where we as European player have to specify in detail everything they have to do. We can't just say comply with European regulations. We have to specify and contractually negotiate the price for those efforts. So if we can align that as much as possible or even have a uh, default value, it's. I agree with your point about there is a, a, there are shades of carbon footprints and in CBAM. But if at least you have like a default value where you can say, okay, for this RFMBO or this low carbon hydrogen, this is the carbon max carbon footprint, which we have demonstrated elsewhere. If you want to have fun and demonstrate that you're even lower, go ahead, see whether it's financially worthwhile. Uh, that would already indeed be a big step forward. Um, just to make sure that those in um, international trade and in that international projects can start going, uh, moving forward. Uh, you made a comment about, um, yeah, we don't know how fast it will go and the Repower EU is, uh, is not uh, set in stone, it's not binding. Uh, yes, I agree with it. Um, but even if we get only halfway to it or quarter of the way to it, it's a massive growth in the hydrogen industry worldwide. It's a massive growth in the ammonia industry. Uh, and that also means that we have to get started right now with those projects to be ready to develop them uh, to deliver in 2030. Um, so that is is my point. Let's let's keep it as balanced and as fair as possible. From the original intention, we want to incentivize the 
low carbon footprint imports. Uh, and let's try to indeed make the procedure contractually as easy as possible to handle in an international paid relation where you're working with partners. Producers, users. Yeah, but we're also users, so we would be very happy if, if we have a hydrogen backbone with very cost-effective hydrogen in Europe, then we would be very happy to use it as well. And we solve our export competitiveness problem. <laughs> well, listen, uh, thanks a lot, uh, Luke. We, uh, uh, there's Stephen Lewis. If you want to, Stephen, if you want to introduce yourself, uh, Peter still has the hands up, but I guess yeah, I think it's probably not... Uh, there's more people raising their hands, but first, Stephen, are you there? Well, no. Okay, I think he will be joining the seminar. Something happened, but he will be there. Stephen? Stephen? Sorry, wrong pronunciation. No? Hi there, Hello? sorry. Yeah. Can you can can you can you can you go ahead, please, Stefan? I think it's a bad connection, probably. Yeah, it's not. It's not very good. Um, sorry, um, I didn't. I didn't have my hand raised or anything. Um. <laughs> <laughs> well, you did, but that's oh. okay. <laughs> but that's okay. You don't. It's been an accident. My apologies. It doesn't mean that you have to say anything. It's okay. Go to this is like in school, you, you kind of wake up and see the, the teacher says, what do what you have to say? And I'm, I'm like, I always want to be a teacher. Uh, I can see that. Um, anyone anyone else that, uh, I don't know, Aaron, Michael, uh, from your side, guys? I see Peter. Well, I don't know. Peter still has the hand up, but I, I think last time I tried to promote him, I was unsuccessful in my attempt. Dimitrios? Dimitrios? Yes, uh, thank you uh, for the uh, very interesting discussion. It's good to hear that it's a, bit, a lot of momentum. I just like to give you a little perspective from the EBRD side as we are trying to align our operations in our countries that we work in with, with the CBAM and the overall hydrogen discussion. Mm -hmm. And these might be relevant for consideration in your companies and the overall policy discussions mm -hmm. that the EU is ha having. Now, we as a development finance institution, we made a political commitment, you know, that all operations are going to be Paris aligned, et cetera, et cetera. So we've, we, we do have the political mandate to develop low carbon pathways, right? And for, for that, we are developing the low carbon pathway for the entire industrial sector in Turkey. We'll be releasing it uh, gradually from April and steel, cement, aluminum fertilizers. Uh, we're developing the low carbon pathway for the fertilizer industry in Egypt for the cement in Morocco, Tunisia, similarly, Jordan. Now, what, why is that important? That is important because most of these industries are very concerned about CBAM, right? And their export into the EU market. So these low carbon pathways will serve as a blueprint for them of how to align their operations with net zero goal, right? Of course, that, that's the primary goal and how that fits into their NDC. But in the short to medium term, they're interested mostly in CBAM. Right. And we're going to be doing a benchmarking exercise on average in 10% 10, 10 most efficient installations for these industries in these countries. And we're going to be setting up preliminary MRV systems. They're very worried about their capacity to implement MRV systems in these countries and how they're going to meet their obligations, as the gentleman from, for, from Yara mentioned. And although, you know, the obligations start from October, and definitely we won't be ready and we won't help, but we're putting in place a technical assistance program to support them in setting up their MRV at the corporate level, at the company level, and at their at, at the um, at, at, at the country level for, for the first uh, phase of the CBAM implementation, which includes steel, cement, fertilizers, and of course, hydrogen uh, coming up. Just letting you know because we'll be releasing all these documentations from April shortly up until you know October November this year with all the uh, corresponding analysis and benchmarking associated to it. How much of Demetrius? How much hydrogen do you see interest in 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 providing facilities or putting facility for export? Is there something that you see, or there's not? It's very insidious. Yeah, yeah, we 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 see quite a lot of projects in in Egypt primarily. Right, and secondary in Morocco. 
um, and we do have, let's say, case studies that are working. And obviously, I can't reveal any numbers, any because these are highly confidential. But that's where the majority is, and 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 the key strategic intent there is for exports into the EU market. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, let me go. I'm sure that some may have questions, but let me go to Peter Bocek first. Peter, sorry, I think I thank I, you. I, I was successful the second time. Thank you, thank you. I hope you can hear me well. Yes, we can. Thanks. Um, yes, I was really thinking that Clinton once said, um, don't tell the Americans how two things are made, uh, law and sausages. And uh, for me, <laughs> the inclusion of hydrogen is one of these examples where uh, like, like, um, like from heaven, uh, hydrogen was included without any proper impact assessment. We have looked at the cost impact uh, of, of the um, inclusion. And we have calculated that the um, um, uh, looking at the carbon footprint of hydrogen with steam methane reforming, you can expect a cost of 550 euro per ton of um, H2, uh, assuming 100 euro per ton of carbon in 2026. If you uh, then a look at the phase out of free allocation, then this amount doubles. That's that's just a, a back of the envelope calculation. If you produce the same hydrogen with electricity and you use the carbon footprint of electricity, then the amount of euros per ton of hydrogen is five times the amount of steam methane reforming because yeah, there is a carbon in, in our electricity contained. And uh, that is also the value uh, in 2034 when the full phase out um, of, of free allocation will have taken place. So it is really for me flabbergasting how, to, how the commission can agree in these negotiations to the inclusion without a proper impact assessment, first of all. And now this kind of assessment, I would hope to you have in your report as well, that you assess a little bit what will be the cost for the European citizen, because this is what we are talking about. It's not the cost for the US producer, or it's not the cost elsewhere. It's just what happens in Europe as a result. Thank you. Very good. Uh... I'm not a butcher. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> we produce no, no, no sausages. <laughs> I thought it was actually a Bismarck, but anyway, I didn't, I didn't think it was. Sorry, funny, Peter, but... for the joke. <laughs> so, <laughs> how did you include No, I'm not going to ask you. <laughs> um, anyone else? Any? Uh, Michael? Yeah, I can certainly add a few uh, comments. So thanks again. Yeah, so let's look at them. Yeah, and, and, and uh, thanks, Richard, for your comments. Uh, I'll start basically on the discussion with the certification bit. I mean, in a foreign distance, uh, in far and distant times, ETS was supposed to be uh, a price finding mechanism, right, to deliver emission reductions at, uh, at the lowest possible cost. Uh, so things like being market based, technology neutral were important. And since CBAM, is supposed to operate on that. I very much welcome your kind of comments on yes, this should be based on intensity. And if it's renewables and they have proper low intensity, they will not pay a CBAM, right? But let that be by proving that their footprint is really zero, not by some kind of certification uh, scheme, I would think. So uh, I think it should really all be about emission intensity, also to Luke's point, and, and not about covers, not about special treatments, I think. Um, in terms of, I mean, we've heard, uh, Luke, we've heard uh, the gentleman from uh, Thyssen Group, uh, I'll speak on behalf of those uh, downstream industries, but those that are not covered by CBAM, um, including the whole cost uh, pass through uh, story around hydrogen is a big concern there. Now, to be honest, CBAM is probably not the biggest uh, concern there, but if, if you look at the, the, the RFMBO mandate for industry, uh, I don't have the exact numbers, but say that half of the quantity, say the 10 million tons a year, um, I mean, um, in terms of the additional cost of renewable hydrogen today versus incumbent, if I use the US IRA support number, which is only $3 a ton, uh, kilo, sorry, uh, which is um, 
a lot lower than what you probably had in mind as a delta. That's 30 billion euros per year that is going to be borne by EU industry without any kind of flanking competitiveness considerations whatsoever. So let's not, um, I would say, uh, pour more oil on the fire by adding uh, all those CBAM costs without thinking about the competitiveness aspects associated with that, right? And yes, longer term, the vision is to include all sectors into CBAM, which we welcome. An export solution is uh, finally found for sure, uh, but we're not there yet. It's going to take a while. Hydrogen is going to go first. Um, yeah, and it's it's just the cost implication EU citizen, but certainly EU industry who cannot pass through the cost to the citizen if they are not in the CBAM scope. Uh, that's a significant additional carbon leakage concern that, that um, we worry about, I think. Um, so, yeah, a lot of other kind of technical uh, comments, but I'll leave it at that high level. That's a key concern, I think. Okay. Uh... I'm looking around the table and looking on, okay, I've got, okay. Greg, Greg or should you want to come back? Yeah, just maybe one additional point on, on the hydrogen. I, I, it's not as strictly related to the debate on hydrogen in CBAM. It might be somehow related also to the steel sector, but also there is a notion of the uh, downstream products, whether they're included in or not. And we, we also, for example, we know that, uh, you know, let's say electrolyzers, there's a lot of steel that goes into them. Uh, so we, we do sense that somehow inclusion of CBAM might also, okay, it will decrease somehow the, uh, the level playing field of, of, of uh, steel imported to, to Europe will be somehow safeguarded so that you can't import uh, highly uh, CO2 emitted steel to Europe without paying CBAM, but you can still import Electrolyzers to be made in China with dirty with dirty steel, and you won't pay anything on top of that. So that might also be an important factor at some point that might decrease the cost competitiveness of producing, for example, electrolyzers in Europe than uh, in China. Because I mean, we only look at level playing field of steel imported to Europe, and we we don't really if you phase out all the free allowances. It will do nothing to safeguard the cost competitiveness of European steel being used in Europe for products that might be exported. Eh? So that's also maybe another consideration. It is a loose uh, connection to the debate that we have today on hydrogen, specifically on how to include hydrogen. Uh, but there are also those other considerations that, that might be important for our sector when looking at the what downstream products are included also in, in, in CBAM or which are not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we are aware of the impact or the possible impact on the downstream sectors. Uh, I mentioned that only very few, I gave the example of nuts, fasteners, and cutlery, which will be included from the beginning. But in the report that I referred to before, and we have to come up with at uh, the end of the transition or period, we will, of course, look at the impact on, on some of the products. We are aware of the situation of the electrolyzers, where I think that 70% is made of steel. So what we need to see is whether the introduction of CBAM on steel and aluminium in particular will have an impact on the production of these downstream sectors, mm -hmm. and in particular, an incentive to produce them outside the EU because mm -hmm. of CBAM. And that's going to be part of the reflection, of course, but I mean, as we have said before, and many, at many occasions, if you have data, information about the impact on these products, but also on other downstream products, please share it with us. And, and that would be part, of course, of our reflections. That's that's clear. When we look at this in the impact assessment in 2021, before the adoption of the proposal, the impact was very low because if you make a translation of the cost of CBAM, at least until 2030, because of the free allowances going away very, very slowly, the impact on the price, on the final price, for example, of the production of a car, uh, the impact of CBAM on the steel for the production of a car was really very very meaningless but of course i mean as the price of ets is increasing because at that time we were considering i think 30 euros nothing compared with the price we have now and of course i mean we look at cars but we didn't look at electrolyzers uh, and electrolyzers are basically made of steel not so much as a car of course uh that may that may have a, an impact in the future so yeah happy to take your data and to analyze the products that you think can be impacted with introduction of CBAM 
on steel and aluminium in particular. Okay, Will William, are you there? Yes, thank you. Uh, actually, it's Amelia and, and not William. Well, um, it, said, it says William on my screen. Apologies for that. <laughs> yeah. It's a, it's a mistake, sorry. Um, thank you very much for, for the information. And uh, just a question, uh, unless I'm wrong, uh, the reason why imports of hydrogen are so low is that the cost of transport is major. So my question is, I know that there are a lot of projections and some very ambitious on the potential of hydrogen, but if we put aside the less realistic scenarios, uh, what is really at stake? Is it uh, likely or very likely or very unlikely uh, that imports could become uh, significant? What organization are you with? Sorry. Just... Oh, sorry, I, I work for the French Treasury in France. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm looking around. Um, uh... I'm happy to try to answer that. Uh, so yeah, I mean, if if there would be no red target and uh, maybe some targets for low carbon hydrogen, the imports of hydrogen would be probably unlikely because it's not done today. But looking at really those highly amb big ambitions that we have, 20 million tons of hydrogen per year by 2030, uh, and looking at that we today uh, have only 8 million tons of consumption all over Europe. How much renewables that will take, how much electrolysis that will take, we are talking about of hundreds of, of gigawatts of renewable power that needs to be developed. And there is a limit about how much we can develop in Europe uh, at cost competitive levels. So from that point of view, if we are serious about those 20 million tons of, of, of targets by 2030, I don't think it's possible to develop all that in Europe. So we will have imports kind of uh, pulled by, 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 that, by that source. And not because, indeed, cost, it, it, it's rather expensive to transport it compared to, for example, transporting oil or LNG. Uh, <laughs> but if we, have, if we are serious about decarbonization, we will need uh, all sorts of hydrogen available uh, and it might be difficult to supply all of it at cost competitive levels only from domestic production. So that's why we do sense that uh, uh, quite a significant portion of it would have to be imported. And I've seen some studies which look at it maybe a little bit further down the line about the long term forecast by 2050, uh, where something around 30, 40 percent of hydrogen uh, was, was imported to Europe. Because it's just cost competitive at some point. Huh? Yeah, I, I see you, Peter. But the, the the other thing is, if the numbers that you quote, uh, Gregor, are correct, then we're trading one dependency for another. So I'm not quite sure where we're going. No, with this. I disagree. Because uh, okay, it's forty percent of hydrogen, but if you look at overall energy imports by gigajoules or uh, megawatt hours, however you want to measure it, the overall dependency will fall uh, by two thirds or three quarters even. So, okay, we will import a lot of hydrogen, but overall our dependency will, not, will be much, much, much lower than it is today. And also the, let's say, uh, possibility to diversify suppliers of hydrogen is much, much more, much greater than, uh, uh, let's say, possibility to diversify suppliers of gas or oil. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, uh, Andre. I was last week. I was listening to the chief economist of BP, who interestingly said um, he finds and BP finds it unlikely that large amounts of hydrogen will be transported, uh, and that there is indeed a very attractive uh, situation now in the U.S. thanks to the Inflation Reduction Act where there is more of a danger that lots of hydrogen consuming industries will be attracted by that. So it's not so much hydrogen being transported from the US to EU, but the risk is apparently much higher that steel and others will be attracted by a very attractive offer of hydrogen locally elsewhere. Thank you.
Okay. Uh, well, I think we've got a, a few minutes left. I just wanted to go around and see if any of the uh, of, the, of the panelists want to add something that they. Uh, I, I just wanted to um, compliment what now has been said on this topic. So, um, the challenge of the reason for importing the hydrogen is basically because we want uh, a zero carbon energy carrier, which can be uh, hydrogen or its. Uh, derivatives and it's the e-fuels and so on. Um, and that is the only reason. Without that driver, indeed, yes, it makes much more sense to import uh, fossil fuels and energy. Uh, and still, as you also indicated, there is a major difference between low carbon and renewable, where low carbon at current European uh, uh, ETS prices is becoming very attractive, especially if you're in a region with uh, a low CCS cost because of a lot of existing gas gas fields, US or Middle East. Uh, while indeed for the renewable uh, hydrogen, uh, we have not cracked yet that nut on how we make that affordable or what market mechanism is needed to make it affordable. And that is indeed a distinction. Um, if you ask me, I, I expect that there will be a wave of blue hydrogen coming uh, in whatever form because it's becoming attractive in Europe. Mm -hmm. um, the renewable hydrogen, yeah, we will have to see at what speed uh, it comes. Olivier? I, I'm quite interested because at the end, uh, we come back to the real issue. Uh, are we competitive or not? And that is one of the basic issues that we had. And let's say, you react telling that the first mechanism, which was the free allowance, was maybe more or giving you more competitiveness toward the export, because I mean, you are let's say, making a deduction of the, of the cost. Here with the CBAM, we are, let's say, giving the full cost, including all in the, uh, let's say, uh, steel industry cost because then you will receive uh, that without free allowance, without stated guidelines. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the real issue is for hydrogen in the CBAM is the same than for the other product. I mean, is this mechanism of the CBAM, uh, let's say, competitive mm -hmm. enough? And in this case, we need to think about the export. I mean, we can say something on how to build these hydrogen in the CBAM without trying to imagine, figure out how we will make our product competitive when we will go and export those products to the other country. So we will maybe to say, imagine the next step, which is how are we going to deal with the export? Because there are a lot of costs which are going to be included in the European production. Hydrogen is, uh, some products are very hydrogen intensive or are going to be very hydrogen intensive. If you take the DRI, I mean, you will have a large part of the uh, steel coming from the hydrogen. But I'm not sure that you are going to, let's say, uh, only uh, distribute the this, this, this steel in Europe. Mm -hmm. You want to export. Yeah. And then, I don't know about the fertilizer, but are we going to keep the product only for EU? I know, but it's uh, at the end, I mean, are we going to change Europe? I mean, the Europe, the chemical industry was one of the most, let's say, uh, competitive uh, sector. The export balance, Peter, it's positive or negative now? I think well, it's... Well, uh, we have uh, a decrease in imports. We have a decrease in exports we have also decrease in production in Europe. So we are really a little bit uh, in trouble right now. Uh, and uh, what we see now, we haven't seen ever uh, in my a long time with the chemical industry. It's really difficult uh, due to the energy crisis, of course, and to, due to um, the Ukraine war. So indeed, there is a serious situation that this crown jewel 
of the European economy is suffering currently. Absolutely. So when you conclusion, CBAM should be a, a tool which will reinforce the competitiveness of Europe. I uh, look, I'll go, Pauline. Um, yeah, I think to maybe to complement on that, uh, to improve competitivity, to yeah, ensure that the market, the European market uh, is, is functioning, we should put like, they think of developing our market and the possibility of production we have before thinking of importing and how we can protect the imports. Um, it is going to be needed, but before importing and protecting, we should do everything we can to develop our domestic production. Mm -hmm. If I can add one thinking, one thought on steel, so you're completely right. Huh? In the future, when we produce climate friendly steel, what did they are, and then with now, at our side, we'll use melting units. Others will use electric arc furnace. We have a special route, but so it's very similar. Um, more or less 60% of our costs for the clean pig iron production will be, let's say, caused by the hydrogen and by renewable power. 40% roughly hydrogen, 20% renewable power. Mm -hmm. So we'll be much more energy intensive than we are already. Yeah? We are already in energy intensive industry, but it's, it will only be uh, uh, getting more. So Clearly, you are right. If you don't get affordable hydrogen available here in Europe, we have we have a big issue. And also the downstream industries, which depend on us in Europe, will have a big issue. And that's why I said we need to find a system. Also, when we implement CBIM, allowing us to access these volumes at affordable prices. That's, that's key, and we should not forget it. I would put it in different order. I mean, I don't think CBIM is meant to deal with competitiveness. That's not the main objective. And what we need to do is to make sure that we help the EU industry to decarbonize. And at the same time, that we make sure that those efforts are not watered down by importation of goods which are intensive in carbon pricing. But of course, we have to implement CIVAM in a way which will not be at the expense of the competitiveness of the EU industry. I completely agree. Well, I'm trying to get Liv and Stalmans to, to join, but unsuccessfully, I'm not sure whether the machine is breaking down or Levan is refusing one of the two. Uh, so you can pick your choice. Uh, Aaron, he has you just joined. Okay, Aaron, you have your hand. You had your hand up first. You want to go first, and then Levan will will can come up to you. Okay. Sure. Just briefly, I mean to to go back to my context is uh, having examined CBAM in the in uh, the other sectors of coverage as opposed to hydrogen, and I want to reflect on the difference between hydrogen and those other sectors. Um, and it deals with the, you know, it comes back to the, what is the objective of the CBAM, as uh, Vicente just said. In this particular sector, we need green imports. Uh, and uh, Gregor pointed out to meet a 20 megaton production. <clears throat> that's not going to happen with European production. It, it, we, we are going to need green imports in the future. And we don't have existing production of uh, of renewably renewable energy sourced hydrogen that's very different from the current sectors uh, it's very different from the steel sector the aluminum sector we have existing production we're worried about the undercutting of that production as a result of increased carbon prices uh, we're worried about imports here we want more imports and, and so is it legitimate for the CBAM to focus then on preventing resource shuffling to prevent circumvention that Let's go back to the objectives. If the if the objective is to protect and promote the competitiveness of EU industry in the production of renewably sourced hydrogen, then sure. If the objective is to prevent leakage and to promote a low carbon uh, worldwide result, <clears throat> Maybe not so much. We're not talking about leakage. We're talking about the competitiveness of a future industry, which is not even established yet, uh, right? At other other than the, the industries which are going to be using hydrogen, like steel, different case. But even then, you know, to go to Peter's point, we are going to see a shifting of comparative advantage. Uh, in, in, in the the natural result will be as as the production of goods like steel is decarbonized worldwide, for. Um, the, the production to take place in places where energy is cheap and there's a lot of sun. Hydrogen can be uh, cheaply produced. So maybe Saudi Arabia or Australia become the new powerhouses of steel production in the future or, or Newfoundland in Canada. Um, and is preventing that the objective of the CBAM? Is it, is it, is it part of the CBAM uh, aimed at uh, retaining production of green green steel in Europe and promoting the production of green hydrogen in Europe, 
So we come back to the objectives. What are the objectives? Mm -hmm. Okay, well, let's we'll, let, we'll wrap up the objective. But first, Levan, are you there now? Yes, I'm here now. I hope you can hear me. Yes, we can. Okay, no, thank you again for the very um, uh, rich debate and, and of course the, the study that uh, was made before that. So uh, I can only compliment that um, basically you are very much at unraveling the intricate elements of the CBAM. I'm glad to hear the commission uh, mentioning that indeed they are also on the way to discovering the, the hidden and the unhidden elements of the indirect part, because that is an element that cannot be ignored, uh, the, the electricity component. Um, uh, of course, we focus now on hydrogen. That was the, the, the aim of today, but a uh, few times there was reference made to, well, what is then the portion of the CBAM in the cost of a car, for instance, and that could apply to steel also, which is in the car. I want to bring in only the element of value chain. That is, if we, uh, if we dilute everything up to the level of the final good, it will always be the case, I guess, that you could say, well, for the steel component or maybe one day for the plastic component or for, I don't know, the hydrogen uh, derived component in the car, this is a very little cost, could well be, because you dilute it over the final, final cost of the product. Uh, so all the energy intensive components are diluted. Um, that is not, well, that will not allow to conclude on the viability of an industrial value chain in Europe. So there I concur with the previous speaker that also that is the question. What of these green products will we still make in Europe and what will we make elsewhere? But other than that, thank you for the study and for highlighting the intricate elements. Thank you. Before I turn to, 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 to our honored guest today, uh, Michael, anything from your side? No, okay. no interest of time. Thank you. I want to hear from Vicente. Vicente, anything, any, any, any final thoughts? No, I think what has been said. I mean, as you can see, hydrogen is a very peculiar product. I think that all the all the cards are on the table. Now what we have to make sure is that they will work. And of course, um, I mean, the objective again is to make sure the CBAM will work that will help to reduce emissions here, but also outside. And at the same time, of course, will not have a negative impact on the competitiveness of the industry. And of course, on the relocation of the industry. I mean, the objective is not to shift uh, EU production to the US to benefit from the IRA, but of course, to produce in the EU. There will be a net zero industrial plan adopted, I think, tomorrow? Yeah. Okay, so I hope you will find some interesting elements to support the EU industry, in particular on the state aid and our environmental certifications and, and on other type of administrative barriers. So, of course, the Commission, what I can say is that, of course, is aware of the difficulties, is aware of the situation, and it's in discussions with the US on the implementation of IRA in the interest, of course, of the EU industry. So all these things will continue to be discussed and there are links to what we are doing and we are discussing here, of course, on the, on the CBAM. And the good thing is that we still have two years to, to get it right, to make it work in the benefit of everyone. And of course, without losing our sight of our, of our objectives. And time will say, I mean, yeah, well, optimistic. It, <laughs> you gotta be, if you are in the tax business, you have to be optimistic. But look, let me. sausages. <laughs> no, listen, a couple of concluding remarks. First of all, I will reiterate what I always said is that this, this, this argument, whether this is competitiveness of carbon leakage, I think that carbon leakage doesn't come before because somebody wakes up on the wrong side of the bed, comes up for competitive. Reasons. I mean, I'm going to move. Okay, like if you're an adventurer, you move to America. I don't know what you do. Okay, but in principle, people do something most of the time for a variety of reasons, including rational economic decisions. And in this case, one could, can argue that 100 euros a ton that economic rational economic decisions will push you into a competitive bind. So, I think that this separation. I think there are two sides of the same coin. At least for me, that's the way I look at it. The second thing is, you know, the, uh, the second thing I want to say is that the paper, we don't have the paper just for, for, for clarity purposes. We are, we have received 
a lot of comments yesterday. So we are furiously waiting to uh, working to, we work this morning, we will continue to work in the afternoon, in the evening now. We'll probably be released tomorrow, tomorrow during the day or on Thursday. But we received a lot of comments uh, yesterday afternoon and, uh, you know, kind of ran out of time overnight to, you know, we work hard overnight, but there's limited. So with this, uh, I want to, first of all, thank my, my my colleagues. Some of them have woken up earlier than others. And Aaron is now getting used to waking up because I have to tell you, he spent a couple of weeks on sitting on a Mexican beach somewhere. So now, <laughs> he's, now he's getting used to waking up early in the morning, um, you know, Antonio, who's been the, the the dynamo of this and 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 a guidance of uh, of Olivia, of course, but uh, also to the gentleman on my left here for taking the time. We always appreciate and never take for granted that you you join us, you and your colleagues, and our gratitude to you and Gerasimo as always. Again, thank you very much, and we'll we'll continue this. Uh, our engagement CBAM will continue strongly. Thank you very much, all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers. I didn't think I didn't think all the panelists.